Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Good morning. This morning I'd like to, to preach on Judges, chapter 16, verse 20. But bef and so that's in the Old Testament, at the beginning of the Old Testament. And if you'll put your finger there, I'll be to it in just a second. Let's start with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, this day is your day. We get to be a part of it. May we never take that blessing for granted. But this day, may our spirits join with your spirit that together... We will cry out that we belong to you, that you are our Father. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. One of my favorite verses in the whole of the Bible is in the Gospel of Matthew. And it's a curious thing because Matthew is speaking at this point in the Gospel of Matthew. He's making commentary on what Jesus has just done. It's in Matthew chapter 13 that Matthew says, Jesus did not teach them anything without a story. And it's not just because I like stories. It's that God uses stories in special ways, in incredible ways. God uses stories where we can uh, kind of be on the outside of the story. And we can look and say, yes, it's obvious. That's the example that we're to follow. Or God uses stories where, yes, that's the example I'm to avoid. And I think, you know, if the truth be told, I've learned as much off bad examples as I have off good examples. But not only that, that it's in the story that we get caught up in the story and we can say, well, this story isn't about me. And then the door shuts behind us and we begin to say, oh, well, maybe God was speaking to me after all. This morning, the story I want to talk about from the Old Testament is the story of Samson. And people say, oh, I know that story. It's the story of Samson and Delilah. Well, the story of Samson starts long before there was a Samson and Delilah. As a matter of fact, it starts long before there was a Samson that the angel Lord went to his mother and said, you're gonna have a child. You've always wanted a child. Well, you're gonna have a child and this child is gonna be a Nazarite. And Samson's mother says, what does that mean? The angel says it means that he's not going to drink any strong drink. It also means that he's not going to eat anything that's unclean or even touch anything that's unclean. That means possums off the menu. He can't eat any possum and, and he, he can't even touch the carcass of a dead animal. And the third thing that means is that he can't have his hair cut. Not now, not ever. That it, you could spot a Nazarite from a long way off because they look like an unmade bed. That they're dedicated to God is what the Nazarites were. And the angel of the Lord tells Samson's mother that her child is going to be dedicated to God, going to be a Nazarite. So she goes and tells her husband, we're going to have a child. And Samson's father Manoah says, well, we don't know anything about raising children. I need to, to ask the, the angel about this. Well, where's that angel that talked to you? And she says, well, he's over there. So he goes and talks to the angel. Well, uh, how do we raise this child? And the angel says, do what your wife says. Now, that's pretty good advice right there. Do what your wife says. 
And the angel tells him you're going to raise him as a Nazarite. And that means that, you know, he's, uh, he's not going to have strong drink. That he's not going to touch anything unclean. That's an important part of the story. It's repeated twice there for a reason. And that not only that, he's not going to have his hair cut. He's going to look like an unmade bed for the rest of his life. So, Samson's born, and his mother and father love him dearly. And at the end of that, verse 15 tells us that not only did they love him dearly, but that he was blessed. The Lord blessed him. And not only that, in verse 25, it says, and the Spirit of the Lord stirred in him. That Samson, even before he was born, was given great blessing. That the Lord blessed him. He was given great blessing. That the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. He was given great blessing. His parents loved him and loved him dearly. And you, you think that anybody who starts life with incredible blessing like that would be on the road to sainthood, but that's not where we find Samson. We find him instead on the road to Timnah in the very next verse. Well, Timnah is anything but the road to sainthood. The, the minute that you hear Tim, you, you, Timnah, you know that he's up to no good. Because Timnah was a city of the Philistines, and the Philistines had been beaten up on God's people for longer than they could remember. The Philistines hated God's people and hated God, and they lorded it over them any time they wanted to beat up on God's people. That's exactly what they did. And this was the road that Samson was on. And the worst happens that could happen. He sets his eyes on a, a girl in Timnah, he falls in love with her. He goes back to his father and says, get her for me. Manoah, Samson's father, says, Samson, Samson. Oy vey, or something like that anyway. He says, oh, the beautiful girls that are here and, and that are Israelites. And you can't love one of them. Certainly, you, you, these people hate us. They've been beating the stuffing out of us for longer than we can remember. Samson says, get her for me. So his father says, go back, tell her father that I'll be down there. I'll pay for the, 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 the rehearsal dinner. And it goes on seven days. And tell, her that I'll, tell him that I'll be down there and you want to marry his daughter and I approve of it. And so as Samson goes back down to Timnah, he's attacked by a lion. Well, Samson kills the lion with his bare hands, throws him off the path and goes on down to Timnah. He tells her father... The, the girl's father, well, my father's coming down. He'll pay for the whole spread and we'll have a rehearsal. Seven days of feast, feasting is, is what we'll do. And, and so I'll go back and get my father. So he's going back up to the road to home. And he, he remembers that he killed the lion somewhere around there. And he doesn't want to touch the lion or anything. After all, he's a Nazarite. But he does want to poke it with a stick. I mean, we all like poking thing, dead things with a stick, don't we? And it's no different. He just wants to get close to it. He don't want to touch it because he, he, that's not what he, a Nazarite does. So he finds the dead carcass of the lion and and he discovers that bees have made a nest inside the lion and there's honey inside the lion. Well, he doesn't touch the lion. He doesn't eat the dead lion, but he does reach all the way inside the carcass of this lion and start tasting the sweetness of this honey. And he takes some back to his parents. His parents say, oh, this honey is delicious. Where'd you get this? He says, well, I got it at the getting place. He doesn't tell them. And so they enjoy the honey along with Samson. They go back down to Timnah to, to have the, the rehearsal dinner, seven days of dinner. And Samson discovers that the girl that he loves, has, she has invited 30 of her cousins. And oh, they enjoy just making fun of Samson. I mean, he's this bumpkin. He's not from Timnah. He's, he's one of those slow-witted Israelites. And so they start teasing him. Remember all the times that, you know, the Philistines have whipped up on the Israelites. And so Samson says, I tell you what, I have a, a riddle and I'm, I'm so dull and dumb that you'll be able to guess it immediately. And if you guess my riddle, I will give each, each one of you a suit of clothes. And so you're bound to get it because I'm so dumb. But if you don't get my riddle, then each of you has to give me a suit of clothes. And by the way, I like linen. <laughs> well, they say, what's your riddle? He says, 
out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. So they think and think and think. And three days go by. And that's when they realize, where are we going to get a suit of clothes for him if we don't guess this? 30 suits of clothes. That means we've got to give him our clothes and we've got to go home naked. They realize this whole thing is just an opportunity to, to embarrass them. And so they go to their cousin and say, you, you have to get him to tell us. To tell us what the answer to his riddle is. So... She goes to Samson. Samson, you, you love me, don't you? Sure, I love you. Well, tell me what the answer to you really is. She, he says, well, I haven't even told my parents. Why should I tell you? So she begins to cry. And Samson has a soft place for tears. And so he says, okay, okay, I'll stop crying. I'll, I'll tell you. He said, when I was going back, I had killed this lion. And, you know, inside the lion was honey. Inside the eater, that's the lion, came something to eat. That's honey. Inside the strong, that's the lion, came something sweet. It's the lion and honey. That's the answer, lion and honey. Get it? That's the real, oh yeah, that's great. So she goes back and she tells her 30 cousins, well, the seventh day of the wedding feast, come, or the marriage feast comes on and, and Samson says, okay, I'm about ready for my 30 suits of clothes. You all can start taking off your clothes now. But they say, well, just one more. You know, we've been thinking about this and we've been thinking, you know, out of the, the eater, that must be a lion, came something sweet. Well, what's sweeter than honey? Something to eat. And out of the, the strong, that must be a lion, came something sweet. That, that, it's, it's a lion and honey. That's the answer. Oh, Samson got furious. And he said, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have guessed my riddle. <laughs> well, I want to give a little premarital counseling. If before the wedding you refer to your bride-to-be as a heifer, no bueno. It's just not going to go well. That is a red flag. <laughs> That's red flag number one. Red flag number two was that Samson got so furious that he killed 30 of the wedding guests. Now, if the, the, the groom-to-be starts off by killing 30 of the wedding guests at the wedding rehearsal, it, no bueno. It's a red flag. He kills 30 of them and then gives her cousins their clothes. And he storms off and he goes back home. Well, when he gets home, he goes, you know, maybe I overreacted. <laughs> and he says... It, I can make up for this if I, she likes soft things and I, so I'll buy, I'll, I'll get her a baby goat. Everybody loves baby goats. You love baby goats? I love baby goats. We all love baby goats. I'll take her back and I, I'll win her back for killing 30 of her friends with a baby goat. You know, here's premarital counseling advice number three. If you think you can make up for killing 30 people with a baby goat, you are the problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's a red, red flag number three. But he goes back to her father and says, you know, I realize I overreacted a little bit. Here's a baby goat. and Maybe we can make things right. Her father says, oh, well, when you stormed off, we thought you were gone. And she married the best man. Well, then he really gets mad. And her father says, no, 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 no. I have another daughter and she's even more beautiful than she, than, than, than the first daughter. Well, that doesn't make any difference to Samson. He gets furious and and what he does is he he catches 300 foxes and he ties them two by two ties their tails together and in between them he puts a torch now I don't really know how you tie a fox's tail together but I pretty much figure if two foxes have their tails together you can't get anywhere close or you're going to get scratched you're going to get bitten you're going to get mauled and in between those two is a torch well these 300 foxes with their tails tied together they went through all the crops burned them down went through all the vineyards burned them down went through the grain and burned up all the grain well the men of Timnah they all gathered together to go and to kill Samson. Well, he ran off and he hid in the hills. So they went to his hometown and they said, you remember how we've been beating the stuffing out of you for as long as any of us can remember? Well, we're going to do it again if you don't go and get Samson for us. So they go to and they find Samson, 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 Oive or something like that. And they said, you've got to turn yourself in. 
He said, well, you're not going to kill me, are you? They said, no, we're not going to kill you, but we do have to tie you up. So they tie him up and they lead him back to Timnah. And it's there in Timnah that Samson breaks the rope and he reaches and he grabs the head of a dead donkey and he slew a thousand of them with the head of a dead donkey. Well, you know, you, you, you smote them with a, a thousand people with the head of a dead donkey. You know, people are going to remember who you are. So the very next scene, we see him not walking down the road to Timnah, but down the road to Gaza. Now, you think Timnah's bad, Gaza's worse. This is the capital city. This is where, the, this is the heart of those who hate God. This is the heart of those who hate the Israelites. This is the, the heart of those people that have been beating up on the Israelites since before anybody can remember. This is the heart of the Philistines. And he's down there walking around along the road. He's not flirting with sin. He's chest deep, neck deep in sin. And, and he falls in love with another one, Delilah. And so she says, you know, give me your secret. And he said, nah, I'm not going to give you my secret. So she begins to, 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 to beg him, give me your secret. And he says, okay, okay, okay. He says, I, you know, my secret is if I am tied up with seven bowstrings, I can't break them. Six bowstrings I don't have any problem with. Seven bowstrings I can't break loose. So she says like this, and she ties him with seven bowstrings. He says, yeah, just like that. So then she calls out. She says, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are coming. Well, that's her signal for the Philistines to come on in. Oh, the Philistines come, and he snaps the seven bowstrings, and he, he smote them all. And he laughs and laughs, and she cries and cries, and he says, you don't love me. He says, yes, I love you. She said, no, if you love me, you'd tell me your secret. So he says, okay, it's not bowstrings. It's fresh rope. I don't know what it is, but, you know, old rope, I can snap it anytime I'm tied up with it. Fresh rope, I can't. So she says, like this, and she ties him up with the fresh ro uh, rope. And, and he says, yeah, just like that. So she calls out, she says, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are coming. Well, he snaps the fresh rope, and he smote them all. And, and he laughs and laughs, and she cries and cries. And she says, you don't love me. He says, yes, I love you. And she says, no, if you love me, you'd tell me your secret. And he says, okay, okay, it's not the bowstrings, it's not the rope. It's my hair. Now he's getting close. Now, just like before, he's, he's flirting with sin. He's flirting with the very thing that he ought not be doing, but that's what he does. And he says, yeah, it's my hair. He says, if, if my hair is woven into a little rug, now I realize this sounds pretty weird, but that's what it says. If my hair is woven into a little rug and you put a pin in my hair between there and the weaver's bean, I can't shake loose from the weaver's beam and I'm just like any other man so he falls asleep and she weaves his hair into a little rug and she puts a pin in it between his hair and the weaver's beam and then she she cries out Samson Samson the Philistines are coming and that's their 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 signal and they, they come busting in and Samson pulls out the pin shakes his hair loose from the weaver's beam and he smote them all well, he laughs and laughs and she cries and cries and she says, you don't love me. She, he says, of course I love you. She says, no, if you love me, you'd tell me your secret. And then she keeps on crying and she keeps on asking. And then this is what it says in, ver, in chapter 16, verse 16. She says, she nagged him with her words day after day and begged him until he became worn out to the point of death. He, she nagged him to death is what she did. Now, he could, he could put up with a, with a lion, but he couldn't put up with a nagging woman. And so he told his secret. He said, the secret is in my hair. It's not being woven into a little blanket. It's being shaved off my head. So he fell asleep, and she calls the barber to come in to put a razor. Now, he goes from looking like an unmade bed to looking like a skinned rabbit and she cries out Samson Samson the Philistines are coming that's the signal they come in and the Philistines they blind him they not only blind him but they bind him with bronze chains and they put him in prison it's a story it's a story where, where God teaches us. God teaches us that word of blessing. 
And the word of blessing is a word for all of us, that it's not only Samson, that all of us have been given great blessing by God. That before Samson does a thing, before Samson does anything at all, God has given him great blessing. And God has given you and, and me great blessing that we don't deserve. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That it's not our action that brings the blessing of God. That God's great blessing is all around us. But that leads to the good word number two. That Samson's life isn't determined by his blessing. It's not determined by his strength. His life is determined by his choices. Even with the love of his parents, even with the blessing of God, even with the Spirit of God, that his choices take him down the wrong roads. The roads to Timnah, the road to Gaza. And that his life is determined not by his blessing, but by his choices. We live in a culture today where we spend so much of our time in a competitive way to say, how am I unique? How am I blessed above others? What are my strengths? And I need to find out how I'm unique, how I'm special. Rather than taking this, the blessing that God's already given us and making right choices of that blessing, we overlook the blessing of God and want more and more and more. The Samson's life, Samson's life is, is, is determined by his choices and not by his blessing, which leads us to good, good word number three. It's the word of warning. It's the word of, of warning that in Judges chapter 16, verse 20, it's, this is what it said. This is the key verse. This is the memory verse. This is the climax of the story. Samson says, it says, and he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. That he presumes God's blessing. That he assumes that, that God is there to serve him. That Samson assumes that he is the master and God is the servant and God is there to serve his wants, his desires, his pleasures. And this is the road that leads us to be blind and bound and imprisoned by our desires, blinded by our wants. Colossians 3, verse 12 and 13, Paul is talking to the early church and he's talking to you and me. In Colossians 3, he says, and so as the chosen of God, holy and beloved, that's the blessing. You've been chosen of God. You're holy and beloved before you've done a thing. And then he goes on, he tells us what we should do as the holy and beloved. Put on a heart of compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. A serving heart, a heart that serves God and, and serves neighbor is what he's calling us to. And then he goes on to say in verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. That the blessing God has given is a blessing to serve God to serve neighbor. And just as Jesus has, has forgiven us, we're, we're to forgive others. And if the story ended there, there would be more than enough for us. That, that, that word, that word of blessing, that word of choice, that word of warning. But the story doesn't end there. Judges 16, verse 28, it says, Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time, O God. 
that he's changed. Rather than God serving him, the word is please. Samson has not used that word ever in the story. And now he comes to God and asks please. The, the word, the word is the word of hope. And Samson's strength is restored. He pulls down the temple of the Philistines. Those that hate God and those that hate his people, that God is able to use him. The word is the word of hope, that what Jesus did for you and for me on the cross is he took all those things that would blind us, all those things that would bind us, all those things that would imprison us and keep us in chains, the pride, the stubbornness, the addiction, the shame and the fear, and he nailed it to the cross to take away its power once and for all. And when he rose from the grave, he rose that he might live his life through you and through me. Jesus said, all the scripture bears witness of me. And here in this story, God points to the cross before Calvary. That all of Scripture points to Jesus and what he did on the cross for you and for me. This morning, it may be that you've been going down that, that road to Timnah. It may be you've been flirting with temptation, you've been flirting with sin, or maybe you've gone down the road to Gaza, you quit flirting and you, you've become, you, you've plunged your se, your, yourself headlong full force into doing what you know is destroying you. It may be pride that's kept you there. It's may be, it may be not just pride, but a stubbornness that you're there to serve your wants, your appetite, your addiction. Or it may be a fear. Hear the good news that it was on the cross, Jesus gave his life for you and me for forgiveness once and for all. And he rose again from the grave to give us strength. And this morning, the word of hope is the strength of his Holy Spirit is available to you today. And I want to pray with you. Join with me in prayer. Jesus, this day, this day, yes, may we hear, hear that word of, of blessing. That you've, you've given us great blessing as the chosen of God. That we are a people to be holy and loved by you. Jesus, this day, may we never take that, that word of blessing for granted. Instead, may our choices choose us in, in the right paths to walk with you, the right paths to Jesus to, to walk as, as children of light, to walk in, in your strength through the power of your Holy Spirit. And this morning, may we hear that word of warning that whenever it is we begin to presume your blessing, we're blinded by it. And this day may we know that hope has a name. And Jesus, that name is, it's you. Breathe your spirit on us gathered here that we may call on your name, Jesus, and know your strength this day and in the days to come. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. 
Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir, an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.